Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Geoscience and Geoenergy webinar of 27th of August 2020 today, together with uh, my colleague and friend Sebastian Geiger from Heriot Watt in Scotland. It's my uh, pleasure to host you again with Sebastian this week with another talk. We are glad to announce also that our last speaker, uh, Chris Jackson, is uh, selected as a Christmas lecturer in UK. That's quite uh, 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 we are so pleased to hear that as well, and we are all looking forward to watch his lecture as well later this year. So check, check also his talk in our YouTube. It's, it's in the archive. You can just go through and, and watch uh, his talk as well if you have missed it. Please also subscribe to our channel, recommend it to your colleagues and friends. Let the geoscience community get connected for one hour per week as a, a union for all of us around the world and for a science program. Please also fill the survey. We have posted it online through every channel that Sebastian has found and myself with LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever. Please uh, do fill those uh, questions and let us know about your ideas about how to improve our, our webinars. Also, uh, Poros Media Tea Times talk series are established to let our junior researchers, PhD postdocs, to get connected, broaden their network. Please try to uh, attend and also watch the uh, videos and talks afterwards if you miss them. Now to the lecture of this week. It's my uh, true pleasure and an honor to announce uh, my good and dear colleague, uh, Professor Knut Andreas Lee is our uh, keynote speaker of this week. Uh, Knut Andreas uh, wouldn't need my introduction. I'll read a few lines about him though. Uh, he's a professor. Uh, uh, at Sintef, chief scientist at Sintef in Norway. Sintef is one of the largest uh, national research labs in Scandinavia and in, in Europe as well. Uh, Knut did his uh, master and PhD, master studies and PhD in industrial mathematics from NTH and TNU in Trondheim, Norway. He is, as I said, chief scientist and research manager at Sintef Digital in Oslo, Norway. Uh, Sintef, uh, as I said, also I uh, would like to remind you all that is one of the world's largest independent research organization as well. For the past 20 years, uh, Knut Andreas has led a research group working on numerical methods for geoscience applications, uh, which currently is part of the mathematics and cybernetics department. He's also professor at the Department of Mathematical Sciences at NTNU uh, in Norway. He is a SIAM fellow and elected member of the Norwegian Academy of Technological Sciences. He has so far served also for four years as, as the executive editor of the SPE journal. He is known for many uh, groundbreaking numerical uh, methods, uh, development of the simulation of the geoscientific applications, but also for being one of the uh, pioneers in developing open source simulator development community for geological reservoirs. Uh, you, many of you know already the MRST simulator of his group is found to be one of the very major or impactful contributions in the field used to um, connect people, to let them use and develop science together, make science reproducible, and it has made a major a cultural impact also in the community. Uh, and I also remember one of the earlier talks about it in Siam Geoscience in Leipzig. I guess, Knut, you may remember yourself that when you announced that uh, toolbox, I was also a PhD candidate there at that time, and I downloaded it from being one of the very early people that I downloaded in Zurich back then. So uh, please um, check his uh, Google Scholar page for seeing his uh, groundbreaking work in uh, method developments, application of the methods in the simulation, modeling uh, community, and also about the MRST that also has been published in a book, textbook as well. So it's a pleasure and honor to host you, Knut Andreas, this week. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. To the audience, please note for this very special occasion that he kindly accepted to go through this MRST uh, development. Uh, his lecture may last a little bit longer than typical lecture, so it's going to be around one hour, but uh, that would give us uh, the pleasure of having a permanent record about this fantastic uh, development, and hopefully that will be watched by many more researchers and scientists for uh, years to come. Thanks very much. 
And to the audience also, uh, please, like before, type in your questions. You don't have to wait until the end of the lecture. Whenever you feel it appropriate, please type in your questions in the chat room. As always, Sebastian will share the discussion session after the talk. Knut Andras, thanks uh, once more. The stage is all yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Hadi, for this introduction. I'm I'm a little afraid now. Uh, I might not live up to the expectation that you outlined. Uh, in fact, you got me a little bit nervous, but let's see if we can get uh, through this. And thanks again for, for inviting me. It's uh, wonderful to, to be part of such a good series of, of lectures and so excellent colleagues that have gone before me. So, uh, let me start by uh, okay. Uh, let me start by um, making a disclaimer here. Um, I've seen several of the talks that have gone before, and they are excellent examples of people who build beautiful theoretical cathedrals. My talk today is more about kind of what I would describe as stone masonry. So I, I'm more a, a person who makes tools so that others can realize their cathedrals of, of, of building dreams, uh, their dreams of building a cathedral. So so what I talk about today is uh, the MRST as ha it has been announced. Uh, I will start by trying to explain to you why we claim that it's uh, a community code. Uh, I will also give you kind of a little bit of historical notes uh, about how and why it all did start. And then I will go through some of the things and some of the lessons that we have learned while making this code and, and trying to make it uh, available uh, to, to the general community, uh, what I describe as going the extra mile. And then I will end by talking about important technological steps on the way. And this includes complex grids, procedural libraries and modules, how we made them efficient and so on, uh, discrete operators and automatic differentiation, object-oriented framework, uh, and some two recent additions that are called state functions, and some backends that we developed uh, in order to accelerate the computations. So uh, what is the MATLAB Reservoir Simulation uh, Toolbox? For those who don't know what it is, um, it's a kind of a unique prototyping platform that has been developed over a period of more than 10 years. Um, it's written in MATLAB and it consists of a set of standard data formats, uh, several data structure and library routines for setting things like boundary conditions, source terms, fluid behavior, and so on. Uh, all routines and everything in MATLAB a reservoir simulation toolbox is written using fully unstructured grid format and we have several tools for rapid prototyping of new computational methods this includes differential operators that uh, are the counterpart of the gradient and the divergence operator the averaging operator and so on that you see in your continuous equations and we have automatic differentiation to compute the Jacobians and so on, so that you don't have to linearize your equations by hand. And then we have an objective oriented framework, as you will see in many modern types of simulators. And we have state functions, which I'll come back to. What I think is also an important part of, of MRST is that we put quite a lot of effort into making industry standard um, input support so we can read type of in eclipse input text and, and things like that so that you can use the software to test out your ideas on simple geometry simple grids simple settings and then quite seamlessly move on to also do simulations and tests on on models of industry standard so uh, in the talk i i claimed in the beginning that um, MRST is a community code and in the following slides I'll try to convince you why this is so. So first of all we have a very large international user base. When you rele uh, release a software that's uh, open source like we do we simply put it on the web and we don't know who is using it and for what purpose. So at some point, we decided to employ Google Analytics to uh, uh, track the access pattern 
for um, our, our web page. And what you see here is the cities uh, around the world where people have engaged and looked at the web pages for MRST. We also have similar download data, and, and but we haven't tied the downloads to, to, to cities and so on. So, so this is just the access. But as you can see, we cover quite a lot of major uh, oil provinces and many parts of, of, of the world. Another important indicator is that uh, the software has been used in a large number of master and, and uh, PhD theses. The numbers that I have here are the ones that we are aware, aware of that have come out of Google Scholar notifications or the authors themselves have informed us or their supervisor have informed us about it. There are also more than 200 journal papers and, and 130 something proceedings papers that we are aware of. And altogether, we think that this kind of shows that the software is being used by uh, the, the general community. And it's not used only by the academia, but also by, by industry. And um, so just for the curiosity, these are the download numbers uh, from around the world. We don't have the cities, but we have the, the countries. And as you can see, the largest number of downloads we have is from the United States, followed then by China, Brazil, India, United Kingdom, Norway, Iran, and so on. So all over, we have uh, downloads from 103 countries and 838 cities. Um, and there are, yeah. And if you look at the, the papers um, and uh, the publications that use MRSD, they kind of have been uh, increasing steadily over the years. So we started out in 2008. And uh, in the beginning, there were not that many us users. But now in the last few years, it's kind of grown uh, quite a lot. So all over, we will say with some confidence that what I'm, I'm talking about today can be considered kind of a community code. And please don't misunderstand me. This is not about bragging about use and so on. This is by substantiating that it is indeed something that's being used and not just some invention uh, of, of, of my own group that, that, that we, we claim is important. So if you look at the users, um, the what type of users uh, use our software? We can, for instance, look at the journals. Uh, and this is a, a breakdown of, of the different journals in which uh, papers using MRSD has been published. So the biggest journal is Computational Geosciences. Then you have the Journal of Petroleum Science and Engineering, SBE Journal, and so on. So it covers both the reservoir simulation community, but also, I would say, the uh, water resources uh, community and also people working with the development of computational methods. And this is a word cloud I made out of the, the titles of all the papers written by other authors, uh, not coming from my own research group. Um, and as you can see, uh, the most uh, important word here is method, but you also have important words like optimization, fractured, uncertainty, model, CO2, um, and, and so on. So this kind of gives you an idea about what people is using the software for. So that was kind of establishing that it is a community software. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about the history. So why did we start developing MRSD? Well, like many other things, it grew out of frustrations. Um, in 2004, I kind of started building a research group that focused on multi-scale methods and consistent discretizations on complex grids. Um, our group did, like many others, a lot of experimental programming, and we each of us had our own code. And I remember in particular one paper where we had three authors and we had three different codes uh, that we kind of competed which code should be used to, for, for the paper. And when you run a contract research organization, this is not a good thing. So at a certain point, we also spent a lot of time uh, writing uh, codes in which we tried to reproduce methods invented by others. Uh, and we discovered that we spent too much time rewriting new codes, uh, trying to, to um, 
implement methods that had been implement, uh, invented by others and so on. So we decided to do a systematic development of an internal research toolbox. So the first commit to the Subversion software repository that hosted the MRSD in the first place was in October 2007. A few years earlier, we had as an exercise uh, at Sintef in order to teach many of our researchers uh, better how to, to write scientific papers. We had published a book that contained many contributions that talked about the type of research that we do at Sintef. And as part of this book, we had published a paper that you could have called uh, Reservoir Simulation in 50 Lines of MATLAB. And that was surprisingly popular. Uh, and kind of inspired by this, um, we decided that let's also try to put out our, our own toolbox. Um, there were a few other partial uh, motivations. Um, Sintef has over many years pioneered uh, C++ for numerics. And when I started working in Sintef, uh, this was the thing that the people worked with. So our experience was uh, that prototyping in MATLAB was much more efficient. And we thought that maybe we could try to convince some others that, that this was true. I also had the user frustration as a PhD student. Um, my PhD thesis was about the uh, hyperbolic conservation laws, and I did a lot uh, about research of what we could call transport equations in, in porous media. And for this, I often needed a, a pressure solver, which I didn't have. Uh, and it was not that tempting to spend a lot of time writing a pressure solver and writing a algebraic multigrid uh, linear solver and so on. So I thought that if I had had what I have now as a PhD student, I would have been quite happy. And the th third motivation was that um, as newcomers in the field, it was quite hard to get industry interest. Um, in particular, if the new ideas that you presented were not implemented as part of a commercial simulator. So we thought that maybe if we give away all these things, uh, maybe somebody in the industry might find this interesting and at least try out the ideas. And if they work, they could perhaps contact them, us and work more with us. And then the last point was that if you share your code uh, with somebody and put it out in the open, your self-consciousness will usually force you to polish and generalize what you do a little bit more than if the software is just going to be lying around on, on your disk. So uh, with this, we ended up publishing it. So in, on April 1st, 2009, the first version of MRSD appeared online. The focus was on, on, in, on incompressible flow. So we had three pressure solvers. We had the two-point method, a mimetic method, and the multi-scale mixed finite element method. We also had explicit and implicit transport solvers and fully unstructured grids. Altogether, there were 147 files of MATLAB amounting to 8,594 uh, 8, lines of comments and 6,700 lines of code. So what you see here is from one of the first tutorials that we wrote where we show how this software could be used to simulate incompressible flow on, on the geometry of the Nune field from the Norwegian Sea. Um, this is another uh, kind of example from the software that, that kind of shows the syntax and how it was designed. So this is what we call the hello world uh, of, of MRST. So it's a simple gravity column that, that uh, computes single phase uh, pressure distribution subject to gravity. So you see that uh, the first thing is that you activate gravi uh, gravity, then you compute the make a Cartesian grid, compute uh, geometrical properties like uh, centroids, volumes, and face areas, and so on. Then you make a fluid object that has the fluid uh, properties. You set the boundary conditions. Uh, and in this uh, case, we solve the problem with the mimetic method. So we construct an inner product and then call a pressure solver. And once we've done that, we plot the, the results, and this is kind of it. So this is a type of, of, that, of syntax we used to design 
the first parts of MRST, very procedural type of programming. Um, so you may now ask, why do you do reservoir simulation in MATLAB? And why is this interesting for prototyping? Well, um, using a scripting language like MATLAB gives you a different development process than if you are doing C++. At least that's what I would claim. Um, in many cases, you use abstractions to express your ideas in a form that is close to the underlying mathematics. That's possible also in a compiled language. But um, here we try to kind of do it as compact as possible, and you will we'll talk more about this later. The thing that's different with the scripting language, and also uh, in particular with MATLAB, is that you can build your program using an interactive environment. So you can try out the different operation and build your program as you go. What I typically do when I build a new script is that I construct something, make kind of a partial program, then I start running it, and then I modify the program as I run it. And this is what a lot of my colleagues do also. You have something that's almost working, then you start running it, load up all the data, and then you experiment what you're going to do, go back and change things and so on. And altogether, this is much more efficient in our experience than having to write the code, compile the code, test the code, uh, write the code, compile the test, and test the code, and so on. MATLAB also has got this dynamic type checking that lets you prototype um, by, uh, as I said, by running code uh, line by line. And you can also extend your data types, so you don't know to don't need to know uh, beforehand what are going to be the exact uh, the data types, but you can expand them as you go executing your program. Um, and then you can ask about computation performance, and we will get back to that later today, but MATLAB is fairly efficient because of vectorization, and you can use logical indexing. There are external iterative solvers and so on. So, so it's not that much slower, actually, uh, than a compiled language if you program it the right way. And you also avoid the building process, the linking of external libraries, the cross-platform problems, and so on, that, that you often have to struggle quite a lot with if you work in a compiled language. And there's also built-in mathematical abstractions. Uh, there's a lot of numerical libraries and so on, data analysis that, that you can use for, for, for uh, your advantage. However, if we started today, uh, you may ask, why didn't we use Python? Uh, and at that time when we started, Python wasn't that much developed. So that was not uh, a, a very good alternative. We have considered Python, but uh, it's quite a, an undertaking to, to port all of MRST to Python. And we found it to not be as mature as we wanted when last time we tried. We did the same with Yulia a few years ago, uh, and at least at that time, Yulia was very promising, but, but lacked a lot of functionality that prevented us from going all in. Okay, so once you put out a software like this, uh, one of the important things that you need to do in order to, to make it become a community code is to so solidify it. So we we established pretty soon a stable release schedule. So the first release was on April 1st, 2009. Then it went almost a year before the second release. But after that, we kind of released every sec every half year. So you can see the timeline up here. It's not completely uniform. Uh, so sometimes something gets in the way and we get a little bit delayed with the release, but we try to get out a new release every half year on average. What you see down here is the size of the zip files that contains the software. And as you can see, it has grown quite a lot from the first MRST 1.1 to the latest MRST 2020A that was released earlier this year. Um, so um, at some point, you also want to make your development open and inclusive. So in 2012, we had the first third party uh, contribution to MRST that was uh, included in, in the official release. And from 2018, we also made our uh, 
software repositories on Bitbucket publicly available. So if you want right now, you can don't need to use the, the zip files that are available from our um, web page, but you can take the bleeding edge version uh, that was checked in the, any moment. So another thing um, when you make a community code is to have high code integrity or high code quality. So we strive to maintain the professional code quality of, of what we write. We try to, for instance, only use standard MATLAB so that you don't need the extra toolboxes. We try to the extent possible to be compatible with GNU Octave so that you don't have to buy a commercial project a product in order to use MRSD. We document all functionality um, that the user might utilize, or at least we try to do so. We try to do things like following a consistent name convention, using uh, code review and automatic testing to ensure the integrity of the code and so on. And very important, we perform quite extensive pre-release testing so that uh, all the examples and all things that follow with the software should be working. So this is one example, for instance, where uh, this software has been validated against uh, the commercial simulator Eclipse for one of the Society of Petroleum Engineer benchmark cases. So you see there's uh, um, quite an uh, exact match between the results simulated by Eclipse uh, in as red dots with gray and then the blue lines, which are MRST. So, yeah. So as the software grows, you need to also think about software organization. So in the beginning, everything was just one software, but later we decided to have a modular design. So we thought that since we are, this is a research prototype and being tool and we are working in many different directions, it is important that we try to maintain um, a small core and that this core should be as small as possible and it should contain only mature and well-tested functionality that is used in many programs or modules. So during a certain phase, uh, the core of MRST kind of just shrunk. So instead of expanding, it shrunk, we put out and removed functionality and put it out into specialized add-on modules. And these add-on modules, they are uh, designed to be semi-independent so that they extend or override functionality that's in the core of, of the software. Uh, we have some requirements, for instance, that all modules should have code examples and tutorials that explain what is in there. And so this is one of the requirements for calling something a, 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 a add-on module in MRST and get it included in an official release. And typically a new development, at least internally, starts as a project and then we develop it into a module by cleaning up the code, generalizing it, adding tutorials and so on, so on. And for us, this uh, division is kind of also a way to simplify how we distinguish between public and in-house or client-specific functionality because we have quite a lot of client-specific functionality that is developed as part of our contract research. And much of this is not part of the official release. So the module concept was introduced in 2011. And at the moment, there are 51 modules that are part of the official release. So these are some of the modules that are in there. We have grid generation and grid coarsening, uh, input and uh, output uh, of Eclipse data, upscaling, various types of consistent discretizations like uh, um, MPFA, mimetic, virtual element methods, and so on. We have advanced flow physics like black oil, EOR, compositional. There are several uh, different uh, types of fracture modeling, discrete fracture models, uh, embedded discrete fracture models, dual porosity models, and so on, and geomechanics, and so on. And you can read, read the whole list here. Uh, accordingly, also the size of the software has grown quite a lot. So whereas the first release consisted of 147 files uh, with 6,700 lines of code, 
Today we are up to 3,000 MATLAB files and more than 200,000 lines of code. In addition, there's also significant uh, uh, material uh, that is included in, in compiled languages to provide acceleration of certain operations using the MEXT interface of, of um, MATLAB. Also come back to that later. Another part of making a community code is to educate users. And I think that this is also one of the reasons why uh, MRSD has become widespread, is that we put significant effort into this part. We've made a website, of course. Uh, we have made a user forum where we try to interact and answer questions from, from users. I must admit that we are not always uh, fully able to answer all questions that, that come in. Um, I have published an introductory book that explains uh, key parts of, of the software, like the incompressible flow solvers, the uh, compressible black oil solvers, and, and so on. Each function in the software has got its own man pages that are, are um, documented in, in a standard format, the same type of format that MATLAB uses. And we have written a large number of tutorial codes and so on. And We've also been engaged with uh, right, making some online, online tutorials. So the picture you see here is from a recording that uh, I did at Stanford after um, my dear colleague, Margot Garrison, was so kind to invite me and, and let me share her, her studio for making just uh, in time uh, type of to, uh, jolts, uh, short online tutorials. Yeah. So let's move on to the technological challenges. So one of the first things that we did, uh, and that was one of our, our biggest challenges, was to do complex grids. And looking at the thing like a corner point grid, it may not seem that uh, challenging at all, uh, since it's a very widespread format in industry. However, when you start to look at it in, in, in practice, there's a, a large number of nasty difficulties that, that you have to face. There are things like, uh, so a corner point is described in terms of, of a set of pillars that describe eight points that make up the corners of uh, hexahedral cells. And these can collapse and, and they can, cells can be shifted up and down these pillars and so on. So this means that you have uh, uh, degenerate cells that are not necessarily hexahedral. You may have many neighbors, you have internal gaps, you have non-matching phases, you have twisted geometries, you have thin cells that almost disappear, and so on. So when you, you try to write a software that's capable of doing this, there's a large number of tricks that often are not that well documented that you need to reinvent. So the first years in developing MRSD, this is what we spent a lot of effort on, trying to reinvent uh, and figure out how to process the grid and make uh, robust uh, tools for, for handling complex grids. So this is just a corner point grid, but there are a large number of other grid variants like tetrahedral prismatic grids, perpendicular bisector grids, or general polyhedral polytopal grids. And then later there have been we have seen the type of hybrid grids, there are cut cell grids, there are depot grids and so on, and you can add local refinements. So quite early on, we decided that grids in MRSD then needed to be chosen to be always fully unstructured. So to us, this means that you can, if you choose a fully unstructured grid format, you can always implement any algorithm without knowing the specifics of the grid. And this was one of the key uh, design principles for the software very early on. We also did something to, to do multiscale methods. We needed to make coarse grids. And then we decided very early that any coarse grid should not be a physical partition, but a, 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 a physical grid, but it should be a, a partition of grids so that you could use a vector so that any coarse cell would consist of a collection of fine cells from an underlying grid. Yeah. So the second technology challenge that we faced in building these tools was how to best do rapid prototyping. So in the beginning with all the incompressible solvers and the stuff that we did, 
when we were young and inexperienced, follow a, a procedural programming that, that you saw earlier on in the hello world example that I showed you. So we made special structures, data structures, to represent the reservoir state, the rock parameters, the wells, the boundary conditions, and so on. And the same thing for, for the fluid behavior. And then we had library functions uh, that would uh, compute the transmissibilities, uh, assemble flow equations, and so on. And this had the advantage that you could hide specific details of a geo model and the fluid model uh, when you worked on the discretization, because these could be, you could access them through a general uh, structure, uh, abstract structure that they did not know, need to know any specifics, whether this was a pebby grid or it was a Cartesian grid and so on. We also emphasized vectorization for efficiency and compact code quite a lot. So if you dig deep into some parts of MRST, it may not be that easy to read because the code has been written to be as efficient as possible. And we also tried to define routines that gave us unified access to key parameters like uh, petrophysics, fluid properties, and so on. Unfortunately, this way of programming has certain disadvantages. Um, one of the main things that we faced quite soon was that it became challenging to include more complex physics uh, and to add more solvers and so on. So one of the uh, challenges, for instance, is that if you have a very complex program, it's hard to do the linearization. You, you have to differentiate quite complex formulas with many possible if statements and branches uh, by hand. And, and this is not necessarily very easy. And we often saw that code reuse was difficult. We ended up by duplicating the same code. So if you had, for instance, a, an ex explicit transport solver and an implicit transport solver, they would have a lot of code lines in common. And it was not necessarily easy to, to, to just have them in one place and then reuse them. And as we went on, the library functions that we developed that would work as a tool in the prototyping, they became increasingly complex and they got more and more options to support the many different uh, special cases uh, that we would want to look at. So in 2012, we did a major uh, technological improvement. We introduced what we uh, refer to as discrete differential operators and we also introduced automatic differentiation and for us this was a step change in how we implement uh, various solvers for complex flow physics and in the next slides i will try to explain the basic principles of this so we can start by the grid structure in mrst and here you see in the middle there's a there's a yellow cutout from an, an, a, a grid, and you have one red cell that is neighbor to a blue cell. And the data structure for this is that we have one map that goes from a cell and to its bounding faces. So this, these numbers here is the numbers of the cell, and these are the corresponding faces that bound that cell. And then you have the same thing for, for the blue cell here. And similarly, we have a map that goes from faces to cells. So if you go in and look at, at the phase number two here, for instance, you can go into this data structure and see that phase two is on the boundary at the interface between cells one and two. So if we now have a finite volume method and then we look at some of the key operators, like the discrete divergence operator, it is a linear mapping from entities that live on faces to entities that live on cells. So this is what you see here. So the divergence of a velocity evaluated in a cell C is the sum of the velocities evaluated at the faces multiplied by a sign convention um, that gives you the right uh, sign of, of, of this uh, velocity. So this is essentially what we refer to as a discrete divergence operator. Similarly, you have a discrete gradient operator that maps from cell pairs 
to phases. So if you, for instance, want to compute the gradient of the pressure, you usually want to evaluate that gradient at the interface between two cells. And this is what you have here. So the gradient of a pressure is evaluated at the phase uh, by taking the difference between the pressure on the at the centroids of the cells on opposite, opposite sides of that phase. Both these linear operators, they, they are both these operators are linear and they can be represented as sparse matrices, um, multiplying uh, the vectors of either uh, the velocities or fluxes or the, the pressures. And in a similar way, you can define averaging operators and upwind operators. So if you now go to the finite volume method for single phase flow, the fundamental physics says that you have Darcy's law, which I have integrated here now over a phase. That, so the integral of the flux over a phase, that is the same as the integral of, of the permeability times the pressure gradient times the normal vector and so on. And using this, this operator formulation, we write it as follows. We have a transmissibility vector, which we multiply by the gradient of the pressure and so on. And you can write the conservation of mass in the same way as the divergence of velocity equals the source term. And this transmissibility here is a standard, standard thing that expresses the, the geometry and, and the uh, permeability of the medium. So with this, it means that we can write your flow equations in quite a compact form. So if you have incompressible single phase flow, for instance, this is a pressure equation, which says that the gradient, uh, the, the divergence of uh, permeability times the gradient to pressure plus the source terms equals zero. This is in the residual form. And here I've written the same equation in MATLAB. And as you can see, there's quite a strong correspondence between what's written here and what's written here. And this is the same thing for compressible flow, which is written here in, in discrete form. So I discretized in time using a backward Euler method for the temporal derivative. And then you have the spatial derivative here. So there, once again, there's a close correspondence between these two. Um, when you have the residual equations, uh, you get a system of nonlinear equations, and, and they can typically be linearized and solved using Newton's method. So you have a, a nonlinear equation like this. You differentiate it with respect to the unknowns and set up Newton's method like this. In order to compute the Jacobian, so that's df du, um, you need to often do quite time-consuming and error-prone work. So the idea then is to introduce automatic differentiation. And the general idea of this is that any code, regardless of the complexity, can be broken down to a limited set of arithmetic operations. So for instance, if you have the, uh, a unary operator like uh, the sine of uh, x, you know that the value will be sine of x and the derivative will be cosine of x. So if you then ex introduce an extended pair that holds the value and the derivative of the primary variable, uh, the derivative with respect to the primary variable, here the derivative of x with respect to x equals one, you can then use this type of unary and binary rules plus the ch chain rule in order to compute derivatives exactly. And then you use operator overloading so that whenever your code says multiply, it computes the multiplication of the values plus the derivatives according to the rule up here. So the implementation in MRST is like many other uh, implementations of automatic differentiation, but in our case, it's designed to be efficient for vector variables um, rather than scalars. So we work with sub-Jacobians rather than the full Jacobians. I will get back to this a little bit later in the talk. So let's see how we use this. So here I have two examples here. This is a very simple uh, quarter five spot type of problem post on, on, on the grid here. And then I put up a similar problem here on a little bit more difficult grid. So in small uh, writing here, you have the necessary code in order to set up the grid and the 
compute the, the set up the to compute the grid and compute all the necessary geometric properties and so on. So what you see here is the structure of the sparse matrix you used in order to realize your uh, discrete operators. And once you computed these discrete operators from the grid and the petrophysical properties, setting up and assembling the linear system is, is done in these a uh, few lines here. So the first thing here is that I set my pressure, my unknown pressure, to be an automatic differentiation variable like the one I introduced on the previous slide, so that it, it will hold the zeros plus uh, a diagonal matrix representative representing the, the derivative of p with respect to p. And then I feed that into um, the evaluation of the residual equation, which is done here. Uh, I fixate the pressure by adding uh, one value at the, the first diagonal because it, for an incompressible flow problem, the pressure is, is immaterial and needs to be fixed at one point. Uh, and then I simply solve the system. So this here, eq dot jack, is the Jacobian of this system. So this kind of assembles the full, si full system. And then I divide by the right, right hand side and I get the, the solution. So these are all the lines of code that you need to use in order to solve these two flow programs that, that we see here. And we can, of course, go on and extend this to more complex cases. So, so this is a compressible two phase flow case where I essentially show the lines you need in order to evaluate the water uh, continuity equation and the oil continuity equation. And once you evaluate the two residual equations, so we get two vectors of, of residuals, you concatenate them like this. And then you and when you do the concatenation here, you end up with producing a Jacobian matrix that looks like this. Here I haven't talked about the uh, discretization of Darcy's law that uh, includes an upstream operator. And that operator is a combination of a vector product and some logical indexing to, to, to pick the right direction to evaluate the, the quantities. But it's, it's, it follows the same principle. So looking at now uh, the full code for simulating uh, a two-phase flow, I've skipped the part that sets up a grid and so on. And this is essentially the, the whole thing. You start by initiate, initializing your uh, automatic differentiation variables. That's the pressure and the saturation. Then since you're going to concatenate them into a, a long vector, we set up indices that says that these are the indices in the long vector of unknowns for the pressure, and these are the ones for saturations. And then I have a standard loop. I increment my time. I um, initialize the, the evaluation of the residual norm. And then I have a while loop that loops around and evaluates the residuals and, and solves Newton problem until we have convergence. And the Newton loop is quite simple. We evaluate the residual like this, concatenate the equations as we did for the one phase case, and then we solve it and update all the variables. So altogether, it's kind of a pretty compact code that gives you all you want to do uh, very shortly. And it's easy to extend this to what I would call um, not too complex models. So in sum, what I have presented here, I think, is an excellent approach for fast prototyping of simple IDs and simple simulators. However, once you start moving into realistic simulations, things soon start to pile up. You have to include the complex rock fluid properties. You need to have PVT modules. Many of these have a hysteretic behavior. They may have spatial dependencies and so on. In a full reservoir simulation, you need advanced well models and you need uh, surface facilities. You need control equations to, to uh, control your wells and injection and production strategies and so on. You need time step control for your numerics to be stable. There's iteration control. There's line search methods in order to make your uh, Newton solver uh, 
robust, you need preconditioning strategies, you need iterative solvers, and so on. And you can no longer, in essence, follow this simple prototype, or else your code will become a, an immense, incredible spa uh, spaghetti of, of, of things. So the cure to this, in our case, was to introduce what is called the ADOO framework, which is an object-oriented automatic differentiation framework that tries to separate the concept of a physical model with the equations that describes your physics. And then you have the discretizations and the discrete operators that turns these continuous equations into discrete equations. Then you have the nonlinear solver that linearizes uh, the nonlinear discrete uh, equations, and then you have the and solves it, and then you have the time stepping scheme. And in order to solve your nonlinear equations, you need, as I said, to, to linearize the equations and then assemble it into to a linear system. And very often people tend to be expert on one of these parts and, and not many of the others. And it's very often wanted that you only expose the details you need for what you're working at at the moment. And this is what we try to do with the object-oriented framework to, to only expose the details uh, you need at any time. So if you look at the nonlinear solver, for instance, it's designed like this. You have the nonlinear solver here, uh, which has is coupled to a time step selector, and it works on the state which it evaluates using a physical model and a well model, uh, which is sent to a linearized problem, which in then in turn is, is put forward to a linear solver and so on. And this, of course, uh, the nonlinear solver is part of a bigger simulator, which has uh, uh, what we call a schedule that says what are the time steps that are going to run and what are the controls of my wells and my boundary conditions and my source terms and so on that drive the flow for each of the time steps. And then you need to have things like result handlers that handle the output from, from your simulations. You probably need to have some visualization and so on. And, and, and all of this is part of the object-oriented framework. And in this framework, we have functionality through inheritance. So we have the core module in MRST, whose functionality is then inherited into what we call the automatic differentiation core framework, which implements abstract model classes, time stepping and iteration control, linearizations, and so on. Um, the black oil models, for instance, they inherit functionality from the AD core module. But they also use functionality from the AD props module, which implements the uh, reading of properties from Eclipse input decks, which in turn uh, inherits functionality from, from the reader that actually does the reading. So this is how the, the first of the first modules that make up the ADOO framework look like. And they are like this. We start with a physical model that kind of just implements the basic principles of having a simulator that solves a physical model. Then we specialize it into a reservoir model that has typical features like uh, rock properties, fluid properties, saturations, pressures, and temperatures, and so on. And then we specialize it again into the three-phase black oil models that has the, the type of, of oil vaporized into to, to uh, gas and gas dissolved in, into oil and so on. And with this, we end up of having the capabilities like in a commercial uh, simulator, where we have, an, for instance, an, an input deck on the Eclipse format, which we pass through an input parser. And then we send that to a reservoir model and make up states. And we have grid pe petrophysics, fluid models, and so on. And to the right here, you see an example where uh, the black oil uh, simulator model in, in MRST has been run on the full simulation model of the Nune field. Uh, and it has been benchmarked against OPM flow, which in turn has been benchmarked against uh, Eclipse. So what you see here is the simulation of the real field done with MRST uh, and uh, the 
sol solid thin line is MRST and the thick dashed lines are OPM. And as you can see, there's a almost perfect match here. So we are able to, to simulate a, a real asset using this software. Okay, so what's the next challenge? Well, as you go, uh, this thing starts to become even more complex. So what you see here is kind of the complete dependency uh, of the black oil model that you saw in the previous, previous slide. So you have the states here, so that would be your bottom hole pressures of the wells. It would be the um, oil, uh, the, the gas uh, dissolved in oil, it would be the pressure and it would be the saturation of, of uh, water or oil, depending on your choice of variables. And then all of this is fed into a PVT module that computes things like the viscosity, the phase pressures, the uh, shrinkage factors or the inverse of, of, of the formation volume factors and so on. And once this has been computed, this is fed into computing the accumulation terms, the M's here. Here there are several things that you need to evaluate. You need to compute the well terms that are here, the Q's, and you need to compute all the fluxes. And as you can see, there's kind of a, a complex interdependence here. And one of the challenges is that the same quantities, they appear in multiple places and can have different functional re relationships depending on what type of model that you have. And after having programmed for many years with this, it dawned on us that it would be quite convenient to have some kind of dependency management that would keep track of dependencies um, in this graph that I kind of showed you on the previous slide. And also that would ensure that all input quantities have been evaluated when you need them. We would also like to have generic interfaces so that when we evaluate a certain property G, we don't necessarily need to know whether it depends on S, the, the, the saturation, or the pressure and the saturation. So we would like to have generic interfaces that, that avoid defining these type of dependencies explicitly. Um, another thing that you would need to do is that you would need to have spatial dependency in these parameters. Um, and this is a challenge when you want to do vectorization to ensure uh, uh, an efficient code. So this is also one thing that we wanted to, to be able to do, to have all parameters depend on their spatial position and say still have very efficient vectorization. And we would also like to have implementation of independent, uh, an implementation that was independent of the choice of primary variables. So that when you implement all your, your evaluation of, of the equations and so on, you would not necessarily need to know what you choose as your primary variables in your solver. And last but not least, we wanted lazy evaluation and some kind of caching. So that whenever you evaluated the fluid property, it would be stored in a computational cache so that it could be reused and not recomputed the next time you needed it. So for this purpose, we have recently introduced what is called state functions. So a state function is any function that is uniquely determined by the contents of the state struct. So the state describes the state of the reservoir. And this is typically the pressure, the saturations, the component concentrations, and so on. And it can also be extended by other derived properties that you can compute along the way. So the state functions, they are implemented as a class object and they are gathered in functional groups. So just to illustrate, I have a very trivial example here. Uh, let's assume that I have four a non state, uh, I have four states x, y, a, and b, and then I want to compute the formula x multiplied by y plus a multiplied by v. So this is realized in the state function as four functions x, b, uh, a, b, x, and y that simply extract the content of the, the following uh, fields a, b, c. A, B, X, and Y. And then I have another state functions that multiplies two of them, and then another state functions that multiplies the other two ones. And then I have um, uh, another state functions that add them together. 
And the idea now is that when I invoke G, G is responsible for going back and then evaluating all the other functions that it need in order to get its result. So this is realized in code as follows. We set up uh, the individual uh, functions. So we have a generic uh, function that simply extracts a named field from the state. So this is what is called tutorial number. So I need one for A, a B, uh, x and y i similar i need a, a function that computes the product here i need one to compute the product of, of state function x and y and there's another one for a and b and then i have another function that computes the addition of two different state functions and these things have been written so that when you code it like this and you you do display on the uh, the state function group, which is a data structure in MRST, you get output like this to screen. So it lists all the state functions that are part of this group. And it also gives you links. So if you push the edit over here, you will get up an editor that shows you how this is actually coded. And similarly, if you push the plot, you will get the plot that plots all the things that go forward to this AB and how AB then influence something else. So our idea was to apply this concept to flow property evaluation, to PVT calculations, and to, to the calculation of the accumulation, flux, and source terms. But we could also apply it to spa spatial and temporal discretizations. So all over this gives us uh, the simulator is now starting to become what we would call a differentiable graph. And we are closing in on the type of concepts that are currently used in modern machine learning uh, technology. So uh, whenever we have, uh, in order to, yeah, sorry. Uh, in addition to this, we introduced further granularity. We saw that there were several things that, that were repeated again and again, like in a black oil model or in a composition model, you have components that have typical behavior, like you may have a, a, a water is typically immiscible, so it's considered as an immiscible component. Then we have other types of components that mix in each other, like uh, the oil could mix into both the oleic phase and the gaseous phase. And then you have compositional components like in, um, and you can have concentration components that do not change the, the volume or the density or anything of, of the phase it is in. And by, by introducing certain functionality for this, we could make models that are combined at runtime instead of having to implement one big simulator that at all time has all the necessary unknowns. So for instance, if you were to simulate the three phase, uh, uh, six component uh, model, you would need quite many unknowns. However, if it turned out that in the actual implement, actual simulation that you're running, you only needed two of the phases and, and three of the components, you would nonetheless in a traditional simulator have to, to solve for all of them. However, if you use this granular implementation, you can at runtime decide how many unknowns you will have in your simulator. So this may be standard in some commercial tools, but in MATLAB, it was not uh, how we did it until quite recently. Recently. So what you see here is now the dependency diagram for the total component flux in the uh, generic surfactant polymer model of the ADEOR module that has recently been uh, released with MRST. So each entity that you see here is a state function. And I'm, I'm not expecting that, that you here understand and see what all of them are, but this gives you kind of an idea how the framework works all together. And as I said, we can also do the same thing when it comes to, to spatial and temporal discretizations. So we've done it in order to implement, for instance, uh, uh, adaptive implicit methods. We've done it to, to implement uh, high resolution transport solvers like Vino. Uh, we've done it to implement the MPFA um, discretization for pressure equations and so on. 
So here is one example where we we applied it to simulate uh, 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 a slug solution in in uh, SP flooding. And one of the challenges with slug simulation is, or in general with the SP simulation, is that the chemical slugs it has uh, linear or weakly nonlinear waves that are very easily smeared. So in order to improve this, you can uh, apply uh, improved temporal discretization here in the form of the adaptive implicit method, or you can add improved spatial discretizations like the, the Vino scheme. And by adding this, you see that the sharpness of the, the, the slug, which is in green on a very fine grid, increases from down here and upward by adding more and more factors. And I emphasize that in the actual implementation, uh, you as a user don't have to do very much with this. You just switch and use another states function and then you get an improved discretization. So here's an validation example against Eclipse 100 on a kind of a more uh, complex uh, sector, sector case where we have four different uh, strategies. We can either inject water or we can inject polymer surfactant or a mixture of surfactant and polymer. Uh, and with this thing, we, we now have an EUR simulator that can do kind of the type of Eclipse 100 simulations. So you may then ask, what about computation performance? I will then say that the, what's important is not always the computation performance. What's important is the total time of a program. And this consists of several parts. You have the the time of programming, you have the time of debugging, documenting, testing, and executing. So M MRST is designed to prior prioritize the first four of these over the last. So it means that whenever we have the choice between flexibility and ease of implementation over execution time, we will prioritize uh, prototyping cap capabilities and ease of programming. So the question, of course, is does this mean that MRST is slow and does it scale uh, to, to big cases? Well, the idea of using MATLAB may frighten you off and it may not scale that well, but the answer is that I would say it's surprisingly efficient. And there are several reasons for this. So let's look at the potential concerns. Uh, the first concern would be that MATLAB is an interpreted language. The cure for this is to use the just-in-time uh, compiler that's in, in MATLAB, which means that for loops can be quite efficient. MRST uses a lot of vectorization, logical indexing, we pre-allocate memory and so on, and we use a large number of highly efficient uh, libraries. That takes down execution times quite a lot. I've just outlined uh, how we can use state functions uh, with the, their dependency graph and computational cache to uh, eliminate or reduce the redundant computations that are e easy exist in prototyping codes. So this is a second component. Uh, third issue of concern is computational overhead. And the cure for this is to, to use uh, what, what I will call a new automatic differentiation backends. And the last thing is scalability and performance uh, for which we use high-end uh, iterative solvers. And sorry, I know I, I've, I've been using quite a long time, but I would still like to show you these kind of last, last news from, from our, our, our group. So let me start by the new backends from for automatic differentiation. So if you go back to this G that we looked at earlier on and want to evaluate that for uh, a vector, so that A, B, X, and Y are all vectors. If you look at the Jacobian matrix, it will be, a, um, in this case, a 50 by 200 matrix that has four distinct bands that correspond to the derivative of G with respect to A, with respect to b, to x, and, and, and y. And in the beginning, we, we implemented our Jacobians, or this, this uh, automatic differentiation uh, framework to be like this, that we would store the value in a 50 by 1 double, and then we would store each of these Jacobians 
as a sparse matrix. So we would have a list of sparse matrices, four in this case, that would make up the whole Jacobian matrix. Uh, unfortunately, this is not very efficient. And the reason it's not very efficient is that uh, you, you're not storing so much uh, information here, but uh, any uh, sparse format has a certain overhead. And in this case, we know already that the Jacobian will only have four diagonals. So why use a general sparse format for this? Well, you don't need to. And this is with the new, what we call the new backend. So this is an alternative implementation of automatic differentiation. We try to utilize this. So we only store the diagonals that, that are here. Uh, so if we now look at evaluating this G here, so this is the time it takes to evaluate G and then extract a subset, which is done here, then multiply that, that subset by a factor two, and then insert the subset back into G again. So this is the time it takes just to do these operations if all variables were doubles. This is the time it takes if you apply the standard uh, automatic differentiation tool that has been in MRST for a long time. So I, I emphasize that now you're not only just computing the values, but you're also computing the Jacobians. But the price you pay is that evaluating G now takes 44 times as long time. Using this new diagonal ID, we can get that time down to five times the cost of computing just the values. So here with five times of the cost of just computing the values, you also get the derivatives. So uh, in addition to this uh, diagonal thing, we have uh, introduced modified discrete operators that are efficient implementations of typical access patterns. Like for instance, we, we talked about this map from cells to faces and from faces to cells. And we do some certain tricks to make that as efficient as possible. Um, by default, MATLAB uses column major storage, and MRST is also made using column major storage. However, um, in memory, things are often stored uh, in the row major, and we also implemented a row major storage in order to improve data locality and adjust this data locality to the typical access patterns that you have in the reservoir simulator. In addition, we have had C++ acceleration uh, and included OpenMP for uh, threaded parallelization. And we've done deferred assembly to suit input format of linear solvers. So that is, we do all the automatic differentiation. We store all the basic uh, quantities that we need in order to compute our Jac Jacobians, and then only assemble them when we know uh, the format that the linear solver will be using. And with this, we can look at the efficiency. So uh, in this case, I have a 1 million cell model where I have five variables per cell. And then I'll try to do a few different operations. So this is just like taking the dot product of two different variables per cell. This is doing the dot product on, on faces. I do a substitution of every uh, fifth value and so on. Here I compute the average of values, the gradient, the upwind. And these are maps from cells to faces. And here I have faces to cells, which is computing the divergence. And I do a mixed mixture here. I take cell values plus the divergence of something on, on, on the faces. And as you can see here, uh, the speed up that you observe by, by going from the standard automatic differentiation that has been in, in MRST for several years into going to one of these uh, improved backends is significant. There's a speed up of a factor at least five, and in some cases, 10 or more by going into this. So this means that, for instance, if we now try to assemble a big case, these are, uh, these are four different cases. We have a single phase case, we have a three phase immiscible case, we have a three phase fully black oil case, and we have a six uh, component compositional case. 
And then we assemble this for different sizes of, of cell models, starting from 10,000 cells and going up to, to 2 million cells. And even on 2 million cells with a, a six component compositional model, we are less than uh, 50 seconds to assemble the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, linear system, which is not too bad. The last component uh, is then to interface with an external linear algebra package. Because by default, uh, MATLAB has only um, direct solvers and they do not scale very well. So if we, for instance, consider the, uh, the, the cost of, of solving a, a three-phase flow uh, on moles of, with 8,000 cells, 125,000 cells, 400,000 cells, and 1 million cells, you see with the standard LU factorization, as in MATLAB, you pretty soon hit the wall. So it goes up from 2.5 seconds to almost 600 seconds on 125,000 cells. And if you go to 400,000 cells, it, it's not simply doable. So what you could do, of course, is then in a black hole simulator, you could uh, incorporate a preconditioner strategy, like for instance, this uh, constraint pr pressure residual strategy, and then you can get your times down, but it will still be quite slow. Or you could take the pressure solver of this CPR strategy and compute that with an external library like the AGMG, which is an um, aggregated multi-grid library. And then you could get the, the, the times even further down. And But lately we switched to a very good library, which is the, called the AMGCL, which is a header library uh, written by uh, Demidov. Uh, and which is, is free for use. And then we see that with this uh, library and by using uh, a block uh, ILU plus uh, an, an algebraic multigrid CPR solver, and possibly with some tweaks, we are able to, to do the solve time on, on 1 million cells and get it down to 3.8 seconds for a typical black oil model. And now we are starting to talk about serious computational performance. It's not the best thing that you will find around, but it's definitely not a very slow thing that cannot be applied to nothing, to do anything. Okay, so that's kind of, of, of uh, concludes my overview of, of MRST. Uh, I'm happy at the end to announce that there's a new book coming out pretty soon that will talk about a lot of the more advanced modeling tools that are within MRST. Um, it will contain 14 different chapters that talks about constrained Voronoi grids. It talks about nonlinear finite volume methods. It explains about multiscale methods that have been developed over the past decade. It's, there's some very nice contributions from Harriet Watt University about the embedded discrete fractures and also about a unified framework for, for simulating fractured flow, multi-continuum type of models. There's a nice con another nice contribution from Louisiana uh, about uh, fractured unconventionals. There's a contribution about geothermal systems. There's about uh, unsaturated poroelasticity. Um, there's uh, something about the state functions and the AD backends that I talked about. We have a chapter about chemical EOR, there's a chapter about compositional flow and couple flow and geomechanics. Hopefully this book will be available um, sometime before next summer and it will document a lot of the more advanced things that you find in, in MRST. And once that's finished, we will start a third book. And if you have any possible contributions for such a book, you are free to contact me at any time. Thank you very much for listening to me and sorry for stepping so much over time. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the very comprehensive overview of the Morris T toolbox and, and it was quite uh, an interesting, I see plenty of questions. I would like 
to hand over the, the, the stage to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you very much, Knut Andreas. And perhaps I start um, with a comment from Soren Pop, who says, Dear Knut Andreas, first of all, many thanks for the clear and interesting overview. Developing such a code is an impressive effort. And I think um, what Soren says there, you can all subscribe to it. MRST and your work and your team's work has really made a difference to the research of many, many of us. Um, perhaps I can have start with sort of a high level question myself that possibly captures a little bit of some of the more detailed questions that we had from the audience here. You mentioned there are people contributing specialist to packages to MRST. How can we how can we engage with you? How can we get our idea? There was a question, for example, about um, microbial enhanced or recovery. How can we best engage with you, with your team, to get our code as a tool, as a um, as another package, add-on package um, into MRST? Start by writing an email uh, or making a phone call or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, like in your case, Sebastian, we have done quite a lot of integration of, of your your stuff recently um, what we typically offer is that we we tend to offer to do a code review for instance to 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 look at the code and see how it integrates we typically will want to to run several tests to make sure that it, it works and 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 try to disseminate some of the hard lessons that we learned over many years so uh, to to make things robust and useful for 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 many users i i don't think it's more difficult than that contact us and then we can see what we can do but you 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 need to be willing to actually share your work i mean and that that's important and and being kind of shy and holding back and say that well i mean my paper is nice but my code is awful I, I, that's a very typical attitude. I, I think that's a little bit wrong because the, if you think of it, unless you actually show your code, how can we trust that what you report in your nice figures is the real thing and not something that you just uh, happen to do in GIMP or whatever to make, make it look nice. So, so this thing about having a very nice paper and an awful code, I think that's a thing of the past. You need to have a nice paper and a nice code. That's the way going forward. Yeah, I certainly agree. And, and it comes all about the reproducibility of science and results and actually the impact that the research is generating of other people can use it straight yeah. away. So, so to, 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 to summarize, uh, contact us and we, and we usually try to be forthcoming. And if we're not, my apologies. We we try our best. Yes. There's only 24 uh, hours yeah. in the day, even in Norway. <laughs> I'm going to take a few quick questions here. Um, so one was from Musa. Um, what would be your opinion how we can avoid complex grid structures by using models such as projection-based EDFM? It's actually a two-part question. Because otherwise the grids are aligned around the fractures and faults, um, which creates excessive resolution, complicated grids. For example, in the non model, we have grids of 21 neighbors. Mm. Um, that was a that was a, a, a challenging question. I, I think, unfortunately, uh, no, this, this is not an easy question. And in fact, it's interesting because recently we worked with some of the grid formats that have been designed to actually do this. And I've never seen so bad grid in my whole life. I think the worst case we, we saw had more than 1,000 neighbors for one of the cells. Um, uh, so how you can do EDFM, I, I, I'm not sure if I can answer, have a good answer on that one. Uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, Hardy's PhD student, I understand. So maybe no, I, I mean, I, I know, I know what the, have, what the, um, I, I know what the EDFM method is and the PED EDFM and so on. But exactly how you can kind of get rid of all these models—that's the kind of a thing that 
bugs me a bit more because they are so deeply buried in the engineering practices that even though things like EDFM and PDFM comes, uh, it takes some time before, before, before they penetrate into industry. But, but, but keep, I would say, keep using these methods, keep publishing your codes and your papers that demonstrate their superiority. And if you have a code, publish it, because then people can try it and they may com be convinced and they may, may uh, force the, the commercial providers to, to implement similar things and also get it into engineering practices. Thank you, Kudri. So lots and lots of really positive comments from many people. Thanking you for your um, your works. There's another sort of, you know, high level question from Kishan Kumar. Um, thank you for your presentation. Would like to know if G mechanics linear nonlinear is implemented. If yes, what yeah, uh, we have some it? implementation of of, of geomechanics. Uh, we have uh, implemented the MPSA uh, method, for instance, and there's also virtual element methods. We kind of focused on, on methods that, that can do the geomechanics on the exact same grids as you use for your flow simulation, so that you, you wouldn't necessarily have to do uh, one type of grid for your flow and another type or a typical tetrahedral grid for, for ge your geomechanics. So in the software, there's the virtual element method and the MPS MPSA discretization. Okay. And so th there are a number of quite detailed questions where people ask about something that they can't try to run something they're quoted so it produces some of the results I see in other parts, um, not quite the results that they see in the commercial simulator. So with all respect, I'm probably yeah. going to skip yeah. them uh, because they're very specific to one. I can, I can comment on, on, on things like that. There, there are, and, and this is one of the things that I, I can give a kind of a high, high overview on this. There are many things in commercial codes that are difficult to reproduce. Um, there is, for instance, the there's this classical thing with the black oil models, for instance. So, so how do you, you interpolate your petrophysical values between, or your, your, your fluid values be between points in your data set? How you do this, where do you implement, uh, where do you interpolate one over mu times one over BO, or you interpolate one over, mu times bo or and so on or you interpolate mu and bo and then take the reciprocal things that like that are very important and in order to reproduce exactly what's happening in a commercial code you need to know exactly what are these choices and they're not always uh, documented and then you have all the things that have to do with the switching on and off and wells and so on you have all these very nitty gritty that determines whether you switch from one type of control to another one and so on and doing it exactly like it's in the software uh, that's in the commercial code and when it's not fully doc documented that's very hard and sometimes you have the choice between doing something general and doing something very specific for a special uh, vendor. And we chose to be generic in most cases. And that, that may explain the, the lack Thank of, you, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of exact match with the commercial simulator. Because these things can accumulate to quite large differences actually. This is just one example, mm -hmm. and then there's there's um, many other many other things that that I mean there are so many bells and whistles in the commercial simulator that if you make one of them wrong, you may easily end up with very different results. But there could of course also be be bugs, and if you find them, we would very much like to hear about them. Okay, thank you very very much, Knut Andreas, for this fantastic talk, for this fantastic overview. And I think first and foremost, well, to you and your team for for providing a tool that has really made an impact. And I think the statistics show that it has really made an impact in how many of us in our field are doing research and as we're moving 
towards energy transition, it's great to see and CO2 is always been part of MRST, but no geothermal energy is being modeled um, with MRST. So it's going to be important for, for many, many years to come, I'm sure. Um, a handover for Hardy for some closing remarks. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, sorry uh, to those whom, whose questions couldn't be uh, discussed, but I'm sure you know how to reach the speakers. Uh, and also you can post your questions also in the comments. So maybe later uh, uh, the uh, uh, speaker could come back and just uh, answer the questions in the comment boxes as well. Uh, uh, I would like to just also take the chance to announce the next speaker. Uh, who will be uh, uh, Professor Chris Spires from Utrecht University. Uh, Chris will speak about induced seismicity in the Groningen gas field in the Netherlands. He's a rock mechanic scientist and he's going to, to take us through the story of the Groningen gas field and the induced seismicity uh, issue with it. And then a specific subject of the talk would be about understanding the underlying rock and fault mechanical control. Until next week, I uh, wish you all the best and stay happy, healthy, uh, and uh, safe. Uh, I was looking for the third word that I use all the time, but I didn't remember. So all the best. We see you all next week, the same time with yet another talk. Uh, keep well, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.